Morning, viewers, and welcome to the Economy and Politics Show, where we discuss this policy, politics, investments, as it impacts our economy. And today, we'll be focusing on the subnationals. You agree with me that what happens at the subnational level in the country is very important because it scales down development down to the people. Even as we know that the last uh, tier of government is local government. States are very important because of the role they play in driving development in the economy. And we'll be looking at subnationals and competitiveness, focusing on Ekiti State. Ekiti State is located in the southwest region of the country and has been making efforts to reposition itself for be, uh, to become an investment hub and a competitive economy. It's led by Governor Dr. John Kayode Fayemi, who is the chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum. Today we'll be looking at the prospects, the strides, what has been really happening in the state and how they intend to navigate particularly this unprecedented pandemic. With me on the show is Mr. Akin Oyebode, Special Advisor to the Governor of the State on Trade, Investment and Innovation. Good morning and nice to have you on the show, Akin. Thank you very much for having me. Yes. And first, let's get on to Ekiti State. How have you been able to navigate this pandemic? What has been the new normal in terms of governance, particularly looking at the fact that 2019, your entire generated revenue was 25 billion naira, and your government said you were going to tackle the issue of tax evasion. Entering into this year, there were a lot of plans, but this has been part of the challenge of the pandemic and even the uh, crude oil price volatility, which has affected uh, overall uh, federal revenue. So going forward, what has been the strategy and how have you been able also to support citizens? Some states are providing tax incentives, tax palliatives. What has been happening in this regard in terms of the governance amidst the pandemic? Thank you, Otto um, So firstly, we were one of the, I'll say, first states to respond to the public health uh, dangers of COVID-19. Uh, even before we had our index case, uh, His Excellency Governor Kari Fayemi had set up a COVID-19 task force um, and set up the necessary COVID uh, structure and framework as prescribed by the NCDC. So we were, I'll say, very well prepared um, for the pandemic when we eventually had a case. The, the first thing you need to recognize is that your response must be firstly to quell the public health danger uh, because you can you you know as uh, the gov as the president of ghana said we know how to repair an economy uh, what we do not know how to do paraphrasing him, is to bring people back to life so so that's the that was the priority to ensure that uh, we stemmed the tide considerably and uh, strengthened our health systems uh, to then be able to respond correctly. We've done that. So uh, even now, though we have a spike in cases in Mekiti, where I believe um, 198 at the last time I checked, uh, I'm not sure how many cases we had last night because I haven't checked this morning. Um, but those 198 cases come from two drivers. The first is, of course, we are now in a state where we're doing random community testing. Um, so we're going into the local governments and just testing for the prevalence of COVID. But because we've also relaxed the national lockdowns, right? Um, we were in a situation where the surrounding states, the states neighboring, neighboring Ekiti, had a much higher prevalence of COVID-19. So what you're now seeing is, of course, as, we, as the government has relaxed uh, interstate uh, restrictions, of course, you know, we are now seeing a spike in our cases because we are no longer as protected as we once were from our neighbors. Um, however, we also set up a um, resource mobilization committee uh, made up of prominent Ekiti citizens, and in fact, including former governors of, <clears throat> of the state, <clears throat> former senators, industrialists, etc. cetera. Um, that committee has done a fantastic job um, in helping Ekiti states raise money uh, from the private sector, from uh, development partners, et cetera, uh, to support our COVID-19 um, response. One of the things that, that, that the money we've raised has done was to set up a dedicated uh, test center, which we've done in partnership with 54J. Um, mm. And that test center is what is allowing us now test do randomized testing across the states to understand the prevalence of, of, of the virus. Um, 
We are also renovating some of our mother and child uh, pediatric hospitals. Um, some primary healthcare centers are going to be rehabilitated, etc. So, so that's the first thing. Now, on the fiscal incentives, uh, the Equity State Internal Revenue Service has um, has released uh, some fiscal uh, allowances for businesses operating in Equity. Delayed filings, uh, removal of late payment uh, penalties, etc. We've also uh, suspended the land use charge, which we were going to introduce uh, temporarily for now. Be because again, you know, when people say states have to boost IGR, I often tell them that IGR is really three things when you strip it down to the bare bones. It's yeah. payroll taxes because states cannot collect income taxes. So it's really payroll taxes. It's land, uh, it's land discharge, which is effectively ground rent and tenement rates. Uh, yeah. And it's and it's the, it's the dividend or, uh, or receivables from state-owned entities, you know. Mm. Those are really the three big buckets. Every other thing is sort of just, you know, measuring in the minors. So, again, I mean, we will, we will take a, an IGR hit this year. Um, and I think it's, I mean, it's only normal to do that in the middle of a, what is the, the worst uh, public health crisis, certainly in our lifetimes. Uh, but we, we recognize that we will come out of this uh, strong. You know, we will, we, it's, it's giving us an opportunity to focus on what is really important. And one of the things that I'm keen to see is that the discipline, you know, the expenditure discipline that COVID-19 has sort of maybe enhanced, um, it is important that that discipline is maintained even when uh, the effects of the virus start to air. Okay, that, that, that's well noted. Um, in terms of the fact that you already have your clear focus that it's going to it's impact, going to impact Nigeria, and definitely not just uh, here in Nigeria, we're seeing economies like the UK recording its first recession in 10 years as 20.4% uh, shrinking. So it shows that it's a challenging period, but the level of response and the macroeconomic strategy from both the federal and even state levels will be very critical at this time. And one thing that states are really doing in an engagement interaction with states from the North Central, Nasarawa, to even the Southwest uh, in, in Ogun State, they are looking at reviving dead assets. They are also looking at commercializing uh, assets that have been there and not been utilized for the value of the state. And um, I've seen that in a kitty, there's uh, steps being taken to look at some assets that can be liberalized. If you can take us through the process so far in terms of your state-owned enterprises that you've explored that can be commercialized for value, and also the Bureau of Public Procurement, which is very critical in this whole process. The enactment law was signed in February 2020. How has that helped in terms of public-private partnership and even issues of concessions, which you're exploring now? Thank, thank you very much for that. I mean, I can boldly say that we are the pioneers, uh, and we're showing the way on how to optimize state-owned uh, ent enterprises. If you, you might recall that last year, we, were, we signed uh, an agreement with Pomacido Nigeria Limited, uh, who, have now, who have now taken majority uh, uh, shares in a dairy farm. Dairy that farm yeah. has been moribund for four decades. You know, mm -hmm. For as long as I've been alive, that farm hasn't worked. Hasn't produced a liter of milk, uh, despite the efforts of successive administrations. One of our uh, philosophies is that it, the government is not in the business of doing business. Uh, the government is an enabler of business. Therefore, businesses that should be run by the private sector will be transferred to the private sector. It will be done in a transparent um, manner that ensures that assets are not being transferred into to the hands of friends and cronies. Um, and we did that with Ikundiri Farm. I mean, Promacido is as good as they come. It's a well-known multinational. Um, and today, if you go to the farm, the farm is operational. In fact, we, we celebrated first milk uh, on that farm, I believe, a few weeks ago. Uh, and at full capacity, that farm is going to be producing 10,000 liters of milk uh, per day. You know? So that was the first. We've also put out for public, uh, for, for, for private operators, uh, uh, Ikogo Siwam Spring and Resort, uh, our entire waterfalls, those are two tourism slash hospitality assets. 
uh, Fountain Hotels in, in, in Adekiti as well. And only recently, we closed the tender uh, for the concession to our newly built uh, civic center and the King's Market in Adekiti. We are going to continue to do this in, in, in tranches um, because you do not want to take on too many privatization projects at the same time. But yeah. what the, 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 the philosophy is the same. Um, the Bureau of Public Procurement, you like rightly uh, noticed, has, has a best in class procurement law. Um, and that procurement law guides all our procurement processes. And we even refer to it in our privatization processes. However, what you might not know is that our public private partnership law is going to be signed by His Excellency the Governor um, no later than the end of next week. Uh, the law has been has been passed has been passed by the House of Assembly and is now awaiting uh, assent by the government. The only reason we haven't uh, done that is that we want to bundle the signing uh, activity with the mortgage and foreclosure law, which is going to be laid uh, for consideration and final passage. I hope by the Assembly on Tuesday. So what you will find is that AKT has a best-in-class public procurement law, and it will now be balanced with a best-in-class public-private partnerships law. And I mean, you can, I, I, I urge when the law is passed, we will obviously put all of those laws online. I urge people to read it. It's as good as a PPP law as you'll find in any subnational. Uh, maybe not just even in Nigeria, but across the continent. It, it, yeah. it is very, it, it, it shows, and for us, the intent is to secure the investment of the private sector. So it's to ensure that private capital has the right uh, uh, fallback uh, positions, you know, that, 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 that those guidelines are ironclad, um, that successive administrations don't come and on a win, just uh, reverse the gains of privatization in the state. So this is something that we've spent quite a bit of time working on. And I, I mean, just to add, you might also be interested to note that uh, we, are, we are currently working with InfraCredit uh, if you know InfraCredit, InfraCredit is the subsidiary of uh, used to be a subsidiary of NSIA, um, yes. the credit guarantee company, uh, mm -hmm. and we're working with InfraCredit on an Ado Ring Growth project, um, uh, which InfraCredit will wrap their guarantee around. We are mm -hmm. we have also closed the the bid process, uh, and we expect to have a preferred bidder for that project within the next thirty days. So we are using private mm -hmm. capital a lot. Yeah, it's like in, in just coming, you talk about this, is, this PPP is very important. And, uh, and transparency and implementation will be very key, and that's what we'll be watching because PPP laws are, are being signed, but the transparency and the implementation process and the sanctity of contracts is always very important in Nigeria, uh, which I would like you to speak uh, briefly to in terms of those enablers in showing that contracts, the sanctity of contracts are entrenched and then in the foreclosure and mortgage laws, we know that governors play a very key role in terms of the Land Use Act, the law, the land allocations and all that. What is in place to ensure that technology and titling particularly addressed in, in this regard to improve land access? Great, great question. Um, we are working now on digitizing our land registry. Um, it's a process that will take us about two years. So we might not see the gains till the end of this administration. But the work has started in terms of trying to identify a preferred contractor to do that for us. Um, so, so, but the mortgage and foreclosure law will establish uh, the mortgage registry, properly establish the mortgage registry. Um, and what you then find is supported by our Administration of Civil Justice Act. Again, we're the only state in the country that has an Administration of Civil Justice Act. People always confuse that with the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. But Civil Justice Act means that we have a fast track process for dealing with commercial cases, right? Um, in addition to that, we're working on a small claims court uh, for smaller contracts. Um, uh, you know, just taking, taking some guidance from what has happened in Lagos and Kano um, yeah. and an ADR mechanism. Now, what all these things do is that they provide multiple and sometimes cheap, very cheap options for people to enforce contracts. So we're very clear about the enforcement of contracts, which is why the Administration of Civil Justice Act has been, was one of the first 
law signed by uh, His Excellency, the Governor of the United States. Um, so that's, that, I mean, that for me gives me a lot of comfort that if you have a contract here, there's a mechanism for ensuring that you can enforce that contract and enforce it quickly at the cheapest possible amount. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing I always, I always like to note is you make a point around, you know, um, safeguarding investment. There are a number of things that we're doing to safeguard investments. Of course, first is the security of lives and property, you know, yeah. and two, I think one of the things we've done is to lead by example. For example, there are contracts that have been awarded by the previous administration that we are completing, you know, just because it's government is a continuum, right? I mean, so there's no, I and mean, you have to lead by example. The other thing I'd like to mention is we, I, I mean, sometimes, you know, there's some issues around coordination with government. I won't sit here to, to deny the fact that sometimes it's difficult. I mean, this morning, I woke up to messages uh, from a few people saying, hey, we're being charged X amount uh, for operating POS terminals by the local mm -hmm. government. Of course, I mean, the, my commitment to them is within 48 hours, we will, we, will, we will resolve this. We're going to have a conversation with the local government chairman. So and mm -hmm. part of what we're learning, it's a learning process. You know, one of the things about government is that you learn in public, you learn on camera. You know, it's Definitely. not like a school where you can learn, you know, quietly. So you learn in public. One of the mistakes that we've made, and I, I, I'll hold my hand up to it, is that we've had our ease of doing business uh, committee has the local government um, commissioner as a member. Mm. But it's important now to have a party with the local government chairman themselves, not just having the commissioner as a member, because he's not a local government chairman. He's the commissioner of the ministry. So we now, we're now going to plan a party with the local government chairman to explain to them and you see, because you can't use a stick all the time, you've got to explain to them that, look, what you are doing is counterproductive. You are cutting your nose to spite your face. You know, and that's the way we like to have the conversation, that it's an incentive-based conversation. You know, we've got to give you the right incentives to ensure you do what is right. Right? Well, Otherwise... That's, that's nice to, that's nice to note. Yeah. And uh, at least I really clearly understand your commitment and strategy of your government. And we just hope that uh, in terms of all what you've said, the sanctity of contracts and the enforcement, they'll be taken on board. And definitely, if you do that, you won't have challenges attracting uh, more investment. Well, let's take you to a short video, uh, of course, uh, when Governor Kayode Faimi and you were at the Nigeria Stock Exchange to give an account of uh, previous uh, bonds, state bonds uh, that you've got in assessing the market and how it was utilized. And we will now uh, discuss further in leveraging the capital market in this period and if there are further opportunities. On April 3rd, 2012, during my own first term as governor, I had the honor of ringing the closing bell at this exchange, signifying the successful completion of a 20 billion bond issuance, part of a 25 billion multi-note issuance program. As with our first foray into the debt market, the capital raised was used for infrastructure projects, such as the, the state pavilion, the civic center, the government house, resuscitation of a clay factory, the redevelopment of Ikogos, the Warm Spring Resort, waterworks rehabilitation, road construction, and modernization of various markets. I'm pleased to report that both bonds have been fully redeemed, while the good people of Ekiti State continue to benefit from the project, which supported economic growth, put our people in jobs, and increased access to public utilities. In our opinion, both programs demonstrated how government can use markets to spur development. And like I said seven years ago, I am not only here to ring the closing bell, but also to express the gratitude of the government and people of Ekiti State to the Stock Exchange for believing and supporting our development story. Today, Ekiti State under the current government is focused on reclaiming our land and restoring our values. And what does this mean in financial terms? It simply means making Ekiti an attractive destination for investors, delivering sustainable economic growth, putting people to work, and lifting our citizens out of poverty. And to ensure this happens, 
we have renewed our focus on peace and security, which is the foundation of any economic development, and started investing in developing the infrastructure required to make Ekiti State a competitive destination for business. We've also passed the law establishing the Ekiti State Development and Investment Promotion Agency. Once the agency commences full operations, it will drive our ease of doing business reform and provide investors with a one-stop shop to deal with investment-related matters. It's from what we feared again. I mean, just reminisce of what happened when the governor and you came to the markets to engage stakeholders, uh, dealing members on how they revitalize the various bonds raised. And I mean, it was good to hear that bonds have been redeemed. Those are good testimonies that should encourage other states to assess the market. Uh, what we hear from stakeholders is that states with good credit ratings can always continue to tap into the market to gain more financing for projects that they need. So based on the past uh, experiences and strides, uh, Mr. Akin, is, is your governor looking again at exploring some other opportunities in the market and also the Akiti State's investment agency, I believe is operational now. What are, what are the uh, feelers you're getting in terms of prospects for investments now that you have your PPP in place for signing? Okay, great. Um, I mean, I think we'll always explore various options in the markets, uh, especially as federally collected revenues are dwindling uh, and IGR is going through a short term, short to medium term wobble. Um, one of the conversations I had with you, with, with you earlier was around working with infra credit uh, yes. to raise money, to raise financing for a, a, an important road project. So, I mean, that's a creative e effort as raising funding where it's not the state government who's going to the market because the state government is not a private business. It will mm. be the concessionaire who will go to the market on the back of uh, a capacity payment agreement with, with the state government. You know? So, so th that's one of the ways we're looking to uh, approach the markets. There are many other ways. I will explore all of those. But what is important for me, from my perspective, is that we in Ekiti want to show the, the want to lead the way, right? And hopefully create a, a case study that other states can use. Um, so it's not for us to do this and hide it in our own little cocoon. It's yeah. to do it in a way that other states also can benefit from this. You know? um, so that's, that's to answer that question. In terms of the investment promotion agency, um, our one-stop shop has started to work. I'll, always, I'll use a testimonial. Stallion Group is setting up a rice mill in Ekiti. Um, mm. And one, I mean, the, the CEO sent me a very nice email uh, that said, look, in all the places we've been to, this is the fastest we've mm. ever processed a CFO, right? Um, start to finish, we got their CFO out to them uh, in under 30 days. And that's the commitment of the one-stop shop, that all you need to do is come to us. We will engage with all the agencies of government. Um, and we will ensure that you, know, you get the desired outcome. So on that note, just permit me to say that, look, as of today, you know, we're very interested in the tourism and creative economy. And we, we have identified a corridor in Ekiti um, around, around Kogosi. Um, the Kogosi corridor, Ipole Loro, is a fantastic place for the film industry to shoot movies, etc. And our mm -hmm. mandate as the Investment Promotion Agency is now we're going to engage that industry to say, what are the things you need to make Ekiti attractive for you? So perhaps there are locations that you are currently working in where you think that the regulatory environment is a bit stifling. You know, our commitment is to say, look, Ekiti is open for business. And this is what competitiveness is all about, subnational competitiveness, yeah. is that you have to say, what is your competitive advantage as a state? How do you maximize that? And as states start to compete for businesses, right, you will find that the regulatory environment will become a lot more business friendly. What tends to happen today is that some people have situational or geographical advantages, and other states have not been quick to say, how do we counter those advantages? So those are, those are the things we're doing. That's why we reduced the right of way tariff for broadband providers to 145 meters per, per linear meter. But that's, yeah. a, that's, that's part of, I mean, so that's part of a broader 
reform reform project. So ultimately, it's to say, if you're in certain sectors and we feel that there's an opportunity for Ekiti to take the lead in those sectors, we will do the things that make Ekiti more competitive. So in terms of that, that step, because, because it was... Uh, well received, that bold step, apart from the fact that your governor is the chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum and led the way in terms of reducing the right-of-way charges for uh, broadband investment, how has that attracted prospects for those investments? Because, you know, with the effective broadband, it drives the digital economy. And we are in the fourth industrial revolution uh, era where we need to scale as a country and as, as states the digital economy. Great one. So, um, as of today, we've had one uh, national operator, mobile national operator, uh, approach us to lay, I believe it's 160 kilometers of fiber. Um, so that's an immediate step. We've yeah. had Odua Infraco, who holds the Southwest Infraco license, uh, come to Ekiti to sign an MOU to lay 600 kilometers of fiber. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at, you know, at, this is immediate feedback of the impact of that policy. Of course, it doesn't close until the cables are under the ground. Definitely. In fact, it doesn't close until the people are able to get faster mm -hmm. connectivity. Yes. Right, and I'm even suffering from those connectivity challenges. You know, I've had to use two or three providers to get onto this call. So, yeah. so, so this is something that you know, a rising tide will lift all boats. If we're able to get connectivity across the state, it improves productivity of everybody in Ekiti, and the government itself benefits from that. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, I mean, I'll also like to say is that government is also using digital solutions. In the next few weeks, we are going to announce an agreement with one of the leading mobility companies in the country. Um, and what that company is going to do in Ekiti is help us to first uh, identify and enumerate our riders, uh, our, 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 our motorbike riders in the States. Uh, and on the second hand, help us to streamline uh, and formalize the collection of uh, taxes from these uh, operators, from these riders. Now, again, we cannot announce who yet because it's not been formally communicated, but it's important to say that we see the mobility market differently from some of our other uh, peers, from so some of our peers. So, again, different states are going to come to the table with different strategies. They're going to come to the table with different uh, frameworks, you know, and for us, it's a marketplace. Right. So ultimately, the providers or the companies can then choose what suits their own strategy best. You know, it's like a, it's, it's like a, it's a marketplace. I like to say subnationals have to go out on, at, on a beauty pageant. You know, they have to stand on the podium and show why they should be the winners. You know, and that's what improves, you know, overall competitiveness when we are all competing for businesses, you know. At the end of the day, it's the business community that benefits. So I sometimes joke with my colleagues in Kaduna State, who are, I must admit, you know, uh, the leaders in terms of subnational ease of doing business and competitiveness. I sometimes joke with my colleagues in Kaduna State that my job, uh, like Sir Alex Ferguson's job, was to knock Liverpool off their perch. My <laughs> job is to knock Kaduna State off its perch. Okay, I, I guess you're, I, you're a Manchester fan, if, if, I'm, if I'm right. <laughs> Okay, all right. So um, in terms of ramping up, one of the strides you made, which is acknowledged across uh, the country, is how you transformed the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund. You were the executive secretary, and it created opportunities for hundreds of thousands of people in the enterprise space, and wealth creation was part of it. Now you're managing the, that of Ekiti State, and part of the focus of your Principal Governor John Kai Devine me is poverty alleviation. So so far, how has this been going? I mean, have you been able to translate that experience, and are we getting traction in terms of providing the opportunity for wealth generation through enterprise development? Thank you. So again, I think I mean it would be dishonest of me to say I transformed that sector. I I, I, did, I did no such thing. Um, it was a collective effort. The collective. Um, that, 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 that was supported by a fantastic team, a great yeah. board, and most importantly, the commitment and dedication of Governor Akin Umiambode, to whom I'm always grateful for that opportunity. Okay. Um, so it is a very different space. 
the business the business environment here is very different. You know, there's also a large rural community. So the, the you have to understand the market. You know, there's no one size fits all model. So what worked in Lagos might not necessarily work in Lagos. Also, Ekiti State does not have the fiscal allowance that Lagos State had at the time, you know, mm -hmm. to put that kind of money behind the employment trust fund. However, what we are doing in Ekiti is to first increase Ekiti's participation in all of the development finance opportunities that exist. So what we've done using our micro enterprise, micro finance and enterprise development agency um, is to ensure that there are more equity people participating in whether it's nursal, whether it's EOI, whether it's uh, the CBN healthcare facility, um, whether it's GIP, trader money, market money, you know, all those intervention programs. So we've been able to increase equity's participation in those programs. Uh, but we're also designing certain programs of our own that will ensure that small businesses in Ekiti can get funding at relatively cheap, uh, cheap rates. And then finally, I'm on, the, on, the, on the employability side, we are working with a number of um, interna global uh, te technology companies uh, to run uh, skill upskilling programs that ensure that Ekiti people have the skills to work in the gig economy. I mean, for example, we are at, I mean, we're having very advanced discussions now with Microsoft to see how we can customize the global skilling initiative, which they launched recently for residents of Ekiti State. You know, and we're talking to, I, I can't mention now, but we're talking to one of Nigeria's largest payment companies um, to see how they can in, introduce the uh, e-commerce payment curriculum in universities in Ekiti, you know, to ensure that our people can work in the fourth, uh, what, you, what you call the fourth industrial revolution, but be a lot more active in the gig economy. So that's, the, that's, the, um, that's what underpins the knowledge zone. Recall, you know, for the knowledge zone to thrive, you need physical in infrastructure, so broadband, power, etc. But most importantly, you need talent. You need talent that is resident in Ekiti that can work remotely. And I think yeah. on that note, the point I'd like to make, um, Otto Abbas, is that it's the one thing that COVID-19 has created an opportunity for, that we've seen that remote jobs is now not a thing of the future. It's a thing of today. You know, we now have people working out of Nigeria, you know, earning foreign currency because they, the companies they work for are in Europe and North America. Um, mm -hmm. So business process outsourcing is a critical part of what Ekiti Knowledge Zone is all about. And it also aligns with the economic sustainability plan of the government, right? That identified business process outsourcing as a critical tool. So our next step, just to round up, is that we're now going to target the top 10 to 15 BPO companies globally, and hopefully first con convince them that Nigeria is a great place to be, but more importantly, that Ekiti can be a home uh, for them in the medium to long term. Thank you very much, Mr. Akin Oyebode, yeah, special advisor to, to the governor, to the governor, of, governor of the state on trade, investment, and innovation. It was really nice listening to what has been happening in Ekiti State and how you intend to position it as an attractive investment hub in Nigeria. We hope to have you in further conversations on further developments happening in the state uh, in subsequent editions of our show. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Yes. And that will be all for the Economy and Politics show this morning, Thursday, August 14, 2020. You can join our website, www.proshenji.com, to watch our videos, read our news stories and analysis. Join us by 10 a.m. as we continue the conversation on the market in our Web TV Market Review, where we give you analysis on the financial and capital market as it relates to the economy. So we come your way again. Thank you for watching. Have a nice time and stay safe. Mm -hmm.